thing you offered me an out in this horrible night. I thought it might be Terry, Dan, Ed, and I just kind of looking at each other. Um, so, and tonight is going to be a little different um, because we don't have an outside speaker coming in personally. She's going to be on here. Um, but uh, definitely with the excitement of the weather, maybe some of you had near accidents on the way here, and hopefully nothing like that on the way home. Um, but let's just take a little moment to just kind of come in to our space. Take a deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out and leave the weather outside. Breathe in the warmth of this space. From Isaiah chapter 2. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So it is Veterans Day today. Are there any veterans in our presence? Thank you for your service. I also want to selfishly recognize something tonight. Today is, marks the year of my own sister's passing away. So, um, so I dedicate tonight to her as well. So um, I tried really hard to not be the one doing this tonight. Um, I had a couple other options for veterans and thought those were coming through and they didn't. And I thought, well, I guess that's because I'm supposed to do this. Um, and so let me just, I'm looking for my notes, um, but I don't need them. Um, I wanted to, before I turn it over to Deborah Grassman on here, just to say a few words about why. Um, Deborah Grassman, again, tell me if you were here in March when she came to Center for Faith Studies. So a few of you. I know that it was it was one of those empty nights, and so I thought, okay, we're safe. I, I can I can bring her out again. She's just so good. Um, and Deborah Grassman, I became aware of her when I worked for hospice. I worked for hospice for 11 years for a hospice here in town, and she single-handedly in the country changed the conversation, in fact, engaged hospice providers in the conversation around care for <coughs> veterans at end of life. Um, and she's just an amazing woman in the way that she, that she did that. Um, and what she did was, she, one thing um, that she points out and is pointed out all the time now, is that 25% or more of those who are dying in our hospices or on hospice care are veterans. And I actually tested that. I kept the statistics for a year and a half, and we were actually at around 28 to 30% of our patients were veterans, whether that was World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or the Persian Gulf. Um, so that was one thing, was to recognize that an astounding number of our, our patients are veterans. But that also there is something that happens when they come close to death. Um, and that's where I want to set up this video is when she talks about it, she says there's first one filter that you need to look at. Were they combat veterans? And then later on she says, we actually use the phrase, did you see dangerous duty? Dangerous assignment. Because some people, especially in the Persian Gulf, are saying, I'm not in combat. I'm not holding a gun, I, and I'm not shooting at other people. But they're certainly seeing dangerous assignment, right? I mean, nobody would argue that if they step foot in Afghanistan or, or Iraq, that they're 
in danger, right? So that's um, one piece is, is, did they see dangerous assignment? If they didn't, if they were stateside, if they you know, never, never felt in fear for their life ever, um, that's gonna be a different reality for that dying veteran. But those that were combat veterans, that highly um, increases the chances that it's going to become an issue when they are facing the last days of their life. And then she says there's three trajectories, and when we see her, she's going to be talking about caring for people in the three trajectories. And the first trajectory that she mentions is the integrated trajectory. That is the veteran who feels very proud about their service and uh, soon did very well when they came back. They're in a, in a happy marriage, a happy home. You know, they talk easily about their war experiences. They, and in fact, they are often peacemakers. They are people who really desire peace and they're amazingly grounded people that can teach us so much. That's the integrated veteran. And I, and I remember, for an example, a veteran that we had, he was a World War II veteran. He was a, a, um, he was a, a POW in Japan. Um, so he did see some, some terrible things. Um, but he was so peaceful at the end of his life and um, that we kind of forgot that that was his history. And he was going through the list of the different kinds of volunteers that he could have, and he said, ooh, I'd like a massage. And at the time, we did have a massage therapist, and the nurse said, oh, great. Um, Shirley Sasaki will come and see you on Monday. And he went, Sasaki? That's a Japanese name, isn't it? Is she Japanese? And the nurse went, <laughs> you know, kind of, oh, how could I have been so stupid um, and insensitive? And she said, ah, uh, yes, she is. Is that okay? And he thought for a second, and he said, I would be honored to have her come. And so we told Shirley about what was going on, and she went, and she said to him, I am so sorry for whatever you experienced in my home country. And he said, I am so honored to have lived this long to be able to experience this moment with you. And there wasn't a dry eye in the room or the house, or even in here as I'm telling the story. So that, that is kind of the, wow, the integrated kind of veteran, right? That has come to some kind of peace and forgiveness at the end of the world. Then on the other end of the spectrum is the not integrated veteran, not at all. The PTSD, the, the Hollywood story of the PTSD where you can see it a, a mile away, right? The, the, there's alcoholism, there's drug abuse, there's a, a litter of broken families and broken promises behind them. You can, you can see that they have lived a broken life from coming back from the war. And I took care of those too. You know, I remember one gentleman in particular that I was going to just kind of ease into the idea of him having a volunteer and that uh, I knew that he had a 20-year-old son that he did care about and he wanted to leave a legacy for. And so I started with saying, you know, maybe something we could do in the future and ease into this is to write down your stories and write down the advice that you want to leave for your 20-year-old son and I'd, I'd be very happy to do that with you. And I should have said, and I need to go get my own son in 15 minutes. But I didn't. And he said, oh, let's do it now. And so I was like, well, I've got 15 minutes. I can do at least one story. He said, where do you want to start? I said, well, uh, you want to start with childhood? And he says, yeah, childhood. Let's start with child abuse. So when I was three years old, and he started with a horrific child abuse story. And, I, and that really made me realize that some of our PTSD started before they ever left our country. For many of our veterans, they thought they were escaping the worst to go to war. So that's another end. And then you have the middle, which is the apparent integration. And those are the folks that did fine. They came back, they might have, they might have gotten divorced once, maybe twice, 
Um, but they seem to be doing fine. They seem to, they, they don't talk about it much, but they seem to be doing fine with everything. Um, they, they did well with their careers, etc. But as they start to have multiple losses of their independence, you know, of their health, and they start to lose control of their physical capacities, the war, whichever war it was, comes forefront, and they are back on the battlefield. And sometimes that takes the family by surprise. And so, and we experience that as well. Um, so she is, in this clip, is going to be talking about the way we care for these three different types of animals. Also, as people are coming to the end of their lives, their conscious mind is receding, their unconscious mind is expanding. They start talking metaphorically because <coughs> metaphors are the language of the unconscious. Think about how every night when we go home, our conscious mind goes to sleep, our unconscious mind becomes awake with dreams, metaphors, symbols. So we shouldn't be surprised that people at the end of their lives will often start talking metaphorically. I know our uh, LPN on our unit was taking the Dying Healed course and I was teaching about the metaphorical language of the dying and her eyes got real big and she said, oh my gosh, I moved my mom in with me two months ago with home hospice and for the last two weeks she's been talking about a train in her room. And of course this nurse was reorienting her, telling her there was no train. Only she learned to do things differently because the last thing we want to do is to try to make dying people speak our language. We need to learn how to speak their language. So she goes home that night, her mom's talking about the train in her room, and this time she knew to ask her different questions about this train. So she said, you know, Mama, who's on the train? Where's it going? When's it leaving? And the most important question she said was, Mama, what do you need to get on that train? And Mama said, I need you to get on with me. And this nurse had the presence of mind to say, Mama, this is your train. Go ahead and get on it. I'll catch a later train. I'll catch up with you later. And her mama caught the train that night. And I still felt so good about that because she knew her mother had been asking for permission for a long time. Now with our veterans, they do often likewise speak in travel metaphors. That's very common with people who are dying. They might also be talking in battle metaphors. They may be very sensitive to metaphorical language in the environment. For example, I was doing this presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago and a nurse came up to me afterward and told me how they had admitted a little World War II veteran into their nursing home and they were going to put a air mattress on their his bed and so they got him out of bed, put him in a chair, blew up the air mattress, you know, and um, put the air mattress on the bed and then one of the nurses said to the other, okay, we can blow it up now. And that word blow up set that little World War II veteran into agitation. Now, if they would have done the same scenario just a month before when he wasn't, you know, actively dying, his conscious mind would have still been intact. That word, those words blow up would not have set him off. But you can see how as we start speaking metaphorically, our language needs to change and be sensitive in that way. These veterans might actually be flashing back. So if you have a Vietnam vet and they are telling you that the Viet Cong are under the bed and you tell them there are no Viet Cong under the bed, where are the Viet Cong when you leave the room? They're under the bed. So what do you want to do instead? You want to put the mattress on the floor. We had a veteran who thought that the Viet Cong had put bombs in all the stereos in our rooms. And so the evening nurse who was on duty very astutely when she was told this by him called the police officer came up, she briefed him on what she wanted him to do. She said he did a great job, goes in there, inspects the stereo, and declares it not just bomb-free, but bomb-proof. Goes over to the patient, tells him, you know, I've got your back. When I go off duty, another guard is coming on. Your perimeter is safe. You see, no amount of Ativan or benzodiazepine or Haldol or anything else can sometimes settle someone down the way that can. Um, POWs were often times buried in the ground to be interrogated. Therefore, anything tight or confining or constraining on them can be very difficult. 
even tight bed linens are, are, I remember a nurse one day, she was going down the hallway, looked and saw one of her patients very agitated, uh, stark naked except for his pajama bottoms around his ankles. She gets him calmed down, he wouldn't talk about it until the next day, and then he told her. He was just getting dressed like he does every day, taking off his pajama bottoms, got his feet tangled up in them. And what that did was it acted as a trigger for his POW experience decades before when his ankles had been bound. So you can see how just innocuous stimuli sometimes can act as that trigger. We want to be also careful, people with PTSD, you don't want to put bed alarms on their bed or you're going to get that exaggerated startle response. You don't want to touch them unless they see you coming or you call out their name first. Or again, you're going to get that exaggerated startle response. So you want all of your interventions from people who have PTSD, especially as it's surfacing at the end of life, to focus on helping them to feel safe, to know that they are safe. Be aware that Asian ancestry in the healthcare provider might be a trigger for World War II vets if they served in the Pacific and for Korean and Vietnam vets. And we can't take that personally. For example, I used to work with a Japanese surgeon. I was going to get a consent signed on one of his patients that was going to have his lung removed by him the next day. And this is what the patient said to me. He said, I know this is irrational. I've already checked out my surgeon. I know he's a top-notch surgeon. But you just need to know that I served in Japan in World War II, and I can't stand the idea that tomorrow I'm going to be asleep and a Japanese man is going to be standing over my heart holding a knife. And I heard the fear in this man's voice, and so I called that surgeon. And I was very careful how I reported this, because I did not want the surgeon to think that this man was being racist. But I need not have worried, because this very gracious surgeon said, Oh, I understand. I've heard this before. Tell him I'll transfer his case to another surgeon. Tell him it's all right. He is safe. I also often think about what this man's post-op recovery might have been like if that had not occurred. He may have been very wildly combative post-operatively. If a Vietnam or Korean veteran talks about how Americans treated them, apologize. If they talk about having never been welcomed home, welcome them home. It is not too late. I cannot tell you how many times, especially with our Vietnam vets who were so mistreated when they got home, when I hear that kind of story from them, before I leave their room, I will reach out to shake their hand, or I will kneel down in front of them, and I will say something to the effect of, I am so sorry for the scorn and indignities that you had to suffer because of our ignorance. Please know that you are a hero, and that unsung heroes are the most worthy kind. And I will guarantee you that every time you will see tears. More importantly, you will see a soldier brought home from war at last. Now you see this graphic on your screen, and to me it's a great metaphor for doing end-of-life care or geriatric care with our veterans, because you see them jumping out of air airplanes into unknown territory below. And you see these parachutes opening up, as we do in geriatrics, where we're saying, we can't keep you from jumping into the mystery of death, but we can sure soften the blow and cushion your landing. Well, in this last part, I want to talk about healing with our combat veterans. And the cornerstone with that is forgiveness. I really cannot emphasize it enough. They have a lot to forgive. They have to forgive themselves for having killed other people. They have to forgive themselves for not killing other people. I've had many who have said, you know, they had to pull me off the front lines. I couldn't do it. And so they feel ashamed about that. They have to forgive themselves for not dying. That survivor's guilt. If they committed friendly fire, in other words, killed one of their own, that's a different layer of guilt yet. They have to forgive the enemy. They have to forgive the government for using and betraying them if they're a Vietnam vet. They have to forgive the world for being like it is with war in it. They have to forgive God for allowing the world to be like it is with war in it. And if they are unable to do this before they come to the end of their lives, then they arrive at the end of their lives filled with bitterness. And I can tell you that bitterness is a poison for the soul that greatly complicates peaceful dying. 
So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, what I would want you to take is this. When someone is trying to tell you how guilty or ashamed they feel about something that they have done in the past, don't dismiss it with well-intentioned platitudes like, oh, you were just following order as being a good soldier, or that was a long time ago, you don't need to worry about that now, or you were doing the best you could with what you had at the time. Even though all those things are true, isn't what we're really saying when we say those things is, don't tell me about your guilt and shame. I don't want to hear it. Stuff it behind that stoic wall yet again. Because what they are searching for is forgiveness. I was going on consult to see a patient, and it was clear to me when I first met him that he only had a day or so to live. I call these hospice codes where we are not doing CPR to revive their physical heart, but we are doing CPR to revive their emotional and spiritual heart to bring wholeness. He was a World War II veteran, and I asked him if there was anything from that war that might still be troubling him, and he said there was. I asked him if he would want to tell me about that. He said he would. But then he added that he was too ashamed to say it out loud. So he motioned for me to come down to his pillow, and this is what he whispered in my ear. He said, do you have any idea how many men I've killed? And I just shook my head, no. Didn't say anything. That's one of those sacred moments you do not want to corrupt with words. Then he said, do you have any idea how many throats I've slit? I remember tears came to my eyes. I shook my head. And we sat quietly, sharing that man's suffering together for a long time. And then at length I asked him if it would be meaningful if I said a prayer, asking for forgiveness for what he had seen and done. And he said yes. And so I placed my hand firmly on his heart. And the reason I do that is when you're calm and relaxed, your energy's down low and deep. When you get anxious and upset, your energy comes up high. Oftentimes, unconsciously, we will actually grab ourselves. Why? Because unconsciously, we know it's a very securing feeling. So I often sit with my dying veterans with my hand firmly on their chest for that reason. And this day, I put my hand on his heart for that reason. And I prayed something to this effect. And the only reason I'm sharing this with you is I want you to pay attention to the acknowledgement of the guilt. Dear God, this man comes before you acknowledging the pain he has caused others. He has killed. He has maimed. He hurts with the pain of knowing he did this. He hurts with the pain of humanity. He comes before you now asking for forgiveness. He needs your mercy to restore his integrity. He comes before you saying, forgive me for the wrongs I have committed. Dear God, Help him feel your saving grace. Restore this man to wholeness so he can come home to you soon. Amen. Now this man kept his eyes closed, but there were tears streaming down his face. And when he did open his eyes, this big smile came. It was such a reminder to me of just how heavy guilt weighs. It was such a reminder to me of the burden that he had carried. Well, this is a photograph that was left at the Vietnam Wall Memorial. And there was a note attached to the photo. And here is what the note read. Dear sir, for 22 years I've carried your picture in my wallet. I was only 18 that day we faced one another. Why you didn't take my life, I'll never know. You stared at me so long armed with your AK-47. And yet, you did not fire. Forgive me for taking your life. So many times over the years, I've stared at your picture and your daughter. Each time, my heart and guts would burn with the pain of guilt. Forgive me, sir. So, when she talks about these stories and just carefully letting people tell you their story, you know, it's so, 
deceptively simple, right? That we just allow ourselves to hear their pain and not try to erase it too quick. Um, if I can tell one story about that, I had a, the gentleman that was in that trajectory too. He was a World War II veteran, and he was so loved by his family. This was the the you know grandpa. The, he was just so loved, and, and when they had to move him into the nursing home, his there was not an area of his wall in the nursing home that wasn't covered with pictures of his grandchildren and his dogs and his family. And his grandchildren visited every day. That's how loved this man was. But I would just happen to be in the room with him at one time, and it was just he and I. I was not a chaplain. I was the volunteer coordinator. I, didn't, I don't even remember why I was in the room with him. But he said, I'm really worried I'm going to hell. Anyway, <laughs> I said, oh. And of course, in my world, love erases everything, right? And so I'm looking at the love that's around this room, and I don't think so. But I knew that you're not supposed to do that. And so I said, well, can you tell me why? He said, because I'm a murderer. Because of what I did in the war. And I said, well, have you talked to anybody about that before? No. He, had, in fact, had told, went ahead and let people tell stories, you know, and, oh, yes, I'm a war hero kind of thing, which only made him feel worse because that's not how he felt. He did not feel like a hero. Um, and what he was more concerned about, too, was whether how his wife would perceive him because then was, was she married to a lie? She was married to a murderer all these years, not this beautiful man. So luckily, he told us that early enough on that I was able to get the chaplain involved. Up until that point, he had said no, 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 in no uncertain terms to having a chaplain present with him. Um, I said, you know, she's not going to try to turn you into a certain kind of Christian. She's just better at listening. And he agreed to have the chaplain come. And then she finally... Um, got him to a point where he felt like he could talk to his wife and his kids about his experience. Um, and I think he died rather peacefully. Um, but it wasn't, you know, there was nothing, especially, what was I, 30 at the time? What's a 30-year-old going to say to a man that's seen all that? Oh, don't you worry. I know God better than you, <laughs> right? I mean, um, so it is that just, so when um, she talks about those three trajectories, there's different things that may be going on for those veterans, but the, the way to respond to them is the same, which is listening. Shut this and listen, you know, um, and and then be prepared to be blown away by the depth of what you may hear from people, as far as what they figured out, as far as forgiveness and God. So um, it was very for me working with hospice. It was a great. Um, I was the daughter. Let me self disclose a minute. I was the daughter. My mother crossed the line at SAC Air Force Base. She had a van and bar letter from SAC. She was not allowed anywhere near SAC Air Force Base. Um, and so, and my father was the same. So I was the daughter of protesters, right? Um, and I knew that we rejected the notion that peace protesters were anti-veteran. We believed that we were doing that because we don't want to see people unnecessarily calling themselves murderers at the end of their life, right? We don't want to see innocence lost when it doesn't need to be. Um, but I knew that intellectually. It wasn't until I actually got to serve veterans at the end of life that that became something so deep inside of me that I understood that these men and women, that we talk about their sacrifice and it, we tend to limit that to the ultimate sacrifice, right? That they, they said that they would lay down their life. But they came home from the war, so they didn't actually have to sacrifice, right? I think some of us, that's actually where we go. 
But really, the ultimate sacrifice is the sacrifice of innocence, is the sacrifice of the rest of their life having that they can't unsee the horrors that they saw. And they did that for us. So, um, so working with these veterans just made me see that more. So I thought that would be a nice way to commemorate Veterans Day, was just sharing their stories. So questions that you might have. made such an impression on me when I heard it last winter and then I was just talking to my sister about it three days ago because we were recalling I mean, my parents are getting older so we're thinking about end of life but we're, we were recalling our darling grandfather who was just dear and beloved by everyone the gentlest soul who was an ambulance driver in France in World War One, <coughs> and he would never answer our questions about World War I as we were all doing reports. His lips would quiver and we would stop. But we were, I was recalling this saying, it finally clicked for me that he was so, the last year and a half, he hung on and refused to die and needed to die. But you, we knew how afraid to die he was, but he would not talk about that. But none of us thought to connect it to, I can't even imagine how many legs and arms and heads he picked up on the battlefield in France as you read about World War One. Anyway, it would be nice to all be educated so we ask better questions so that people can. Ah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Other stories or other reactions? I was a hospice chaplain for a period, and I got to serve one gentleman who had been a Korean War vet and he was in an inpatient unit, and he spent all day just hollering at everyone that came anywhere near him, screaming at them, agitated, and he was constantly cold. And this is in Miami, Florida, where it is not cold, but he was chilled to the bone constantly. And when I finally got in there and he started talking about the horrors he'd seen in Korea, and just really started sharing the stories, and so much of it was in the bitter, bitter cold. So I asked him at some point when he was cold, he thought that reminded him of his time in Korea. And he figured it really did. And at that point, he just seemed to resolve that. And he was no longer cold or screaming about that. So it was interesting for him to make that connection of why he hated the cold so much. It was a piece of rock. Lefty liberal types that tend to feel sorry for the veterans and stuff. I was in the Navy six years. Luckily, I never had to see combat. I was on a ship. Uh, as a reactor operator. But, um, we, we all talk about, well, you know, they, they feel betrayed by their country, et cetera. Actually, I think, uh, you know, that's take, doing them a disservice. There, there was a logic. You know, they, not anybody who served in the military is a belligerent thug. There's a logic when you join. You had some rationale. It seemed to make sense to you. You were doing it for altruistic, in, many, in, in a lot of cases, reasons. We weren't all, you know, go, go, to j j you know, go in the military or go to jail or something. And we joined for a reason. Yeah. And so to tell, to then come home and have you have the contempt of the left for military service, the blanket contempt. It's uh, as if we were not intelligent enough to know what we were doing, but we didn't have a reason. It didn't have a logic. Or they, you know, we just didn't understand like you guys do right now, baby. It's, uh, it's, um, it's insulting. If I can just piggyback on that, that, that was something that came true to me too. My nephew, um, Forrest, joined the Navy. Um, and what you need to know is that when my mother passed away, she, passed, she had a year and a half to do it, and she did it in grand form the way she normally did. And so she wrote a dying letter to Forrest, and he was, I think, nine years old at the time, her oldest grandson. And it was filled with wishes for peace in this world. And that's really what she dedicated her life to, right? 
So you need to know that about this nephew. Well, then he ended up as an 18-year-old joining the Navy. Well, my father was just beside himself, just not happy that Forrest was joining the Navy. And I had to kind of take my father aside and say, you know, he's made this decision first off. So you don't really have any say in whether this decision is happening. So what he needs is your support. And don't we need a Navy with men like Forrest in it? He's doing it for noble reasons. Can't you support the noble, the noble reasons? Um, and that was instructive for me too um, in this whole, you know, that it's not a black and white world, right? And, I, and then I have my own son now in, in a military institution, and I had to sign off on, that was so weird um, that you know, he signed off on being willing to give his life. I mean, Coast Guard, you don't think of that very often, but um, he still had to sign off on that. And then also signing off on uh, what happens to his remains, and I'm going, he's 17, why am I signing off on what happens to his remains? But it, it really brought it home to me, you know, that he was doing this for noble reasons as well. And so we do have to allow that every individual is an individual and, and we can't go by stereotypes on anything. And I think that's what she was trying to do too with the veterans is realize, A, they may not have seen combat. It may, you need to ask them how they feel about their combat experience. And when she was raising that, do they feel betrayed by their country? She wasn't saying they all do. But she was saying there are some who do, um, and we need to hear that. And I heard that actually from women veterans of Vietnam who were not allowed to be claiming yeah. their veteran status or who were raped. Um, and so, you know, so they had great pain that they were trying to serve their country. So everybody has their own story, and it's our job to listen to it. We don't force them to tell the story, but boy, if they're ready. We need to be ready to hear it. Other questions or, yeah. I went to college in the early 70s and late 60s. A lot of kids were coming back from Vietnam. A lot of the vets were getting that college. And a lot of them were hurt, hurting folks. They, they, they dealt with some issues there. And already alcohol was a big part for many of them. And it was a, you know, I suppose I, at SAC holding a placard to my son's in the airport now. So life moves on. And it's uh, interesting how it all works. Yeah. But um, one of the things she said that I found interesting, and I ask if you'd speak to her for a moment. The idea that um, metaphor at night when you're dreaming has always been part of my life and figuring that out. The idea that at the end of life you move into metaphoric language. Yes. Now that's interesting to me. And knowing that simple thing, I would have entirely handled the death of loved ones differently had I known that. Mm -hmm. And instead of trying to placate them or say, oh, no, no, I, you know, that just seems big. What does that mean, though? It does, you know, another self-disclosure. My father actually became a hospice chaplain after my mother died. Because of her metaphoric language, it was such a rich experience that he ended up writing a book called When the Dying Speak. Um, and that is, that is entirely about the metaphoric language um, of the dying. Um, and it is, it is this language that they'll use of, um, you, I heard you, who said, who's driving the train? Was that you that said that's what the question that should be? Because that was true for my mother. She was waiting for the bus. And she was really pissed off about this bus driver being really late. Um, and we were waiting around for this bus, and then eventually, and this took over a period of say three weeks, um, oh, maybe a month, that she talked about this bus, and it progressively went from, she was trying to find the bus station, she needed to get the ticket, she was waiting at the stop, the damn bus driver was so late. Bus driver was Jesus. She went unconscious. That was the last we heard her speak. Um, you know, what a gift. So if you can, it, when you do, not to make you feel bad about what was in the past, but to be hopeful for what is in the future, if you do, it, not everybody goes into that metaphoric language, but when you do hear it, to engage in it, to ask them what they see, and not tell them that they're not seeing that, 
is such a rich gift. I'll, I'll never forget my mother <laughs> was laying in, in the bed, and I came in, and I was talking to her, and then she's looking at me, and then she looks to the side of me, looks down, looks at me, and rolls her eyes, and she says, don't you think the least they could do is introduce themselves when they come in? <laughs> and I was like, there's somebody right here. Okay. You know, and she didn't know any of these people that were coming in. Um, but oftentimes when people do see that, that, that really is a month to two months out. That they're not going to do a lot of that kind of visioning until they're really close to the end. Um, but they, the, the metaphors of, of being on a journey, going on a trip, um, bus, train, hitching the horse, um, going home and you realize they're not, you know, you, oh, you are home. No, that's not the home they're talking about. You know, those kinds of things are really quite frequent. And if you are gifted enough to be in that, in the presence of that, to engage in that conversation and go with the flow and, and don your um, impromptu actor um, skills, you know, and just go, okay, well, I'm going to go with you on this. You don't lie to them, but you do say, I don't, my father's favorite phrase was, I don't have the same vision you have. Can you tell me what you're seeing? Um, and then they would share. So, can I tell you one more story yes, about that yeah. kind of stuff? Um, I had a lady one time that I came in, and this was at a time, I don't know why they were making us do this, but I was the volunteer coordinator, but I had to wear a lab coat to go into the into the room, which is really stupid for a lot of reasons. But, so I had the lab coat on, and the lady, she looks at me and she goes, you people, and I'm like, oh crap, we screwed up somehow. <laughs> and she goes, I counted you last night, there were 50 of you that came out of my bathroom. And I'm looking at her bathroom, which isn't as big as that far. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, okay, we're dealing with a different kind of vision here, you know. And I said, so what were they doing? And she said, I don't know, but it irritated me. And, but when I didn't tell her, no, you didn't see that. And I sat down, I said, tell me more about what you're seeing. She said, well, you know, probably the one. There's a guy that comes in through my window every night. He's all in black, and he comes in through my window at night. And I looked at her startled, and I said, wow, that, that sounds like that could be frightening. Is that frightening to you? And she looks at me, and then she furrows her brow, and she goes, you would think it would be. But it's not. I just wish he would say who he was. And so then she told me that there was a child that would come in a wheelchair. And I said, do you recognize this child? She says, no, I don't. At the time, I was reading The Five People You Meet in Heaven by Mitch <laughs> Alba. And you know what? She was a pediatric nurse. So I was like, oh, this is totally somebody she took care of. Um, but she ended up just kind of relaxing and telling me more of these stories. And by the end, she was like, hey. And she whips off her blanket. She's like, you want to see my toe? And it was all being grimace. It was supposed to be. I was like, oh, no, 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 that's okay. We can just be friends from here. Um, but she did die within three days of that visit with her. But it, again, just seeing her visibly relax because I wasn't telling her this is ridiculous. And I was just responding to what she was saying and how it was making her feel, you know? Which, isn't that great for our kids, too? I mean, the things that we learn from the dying are really applicable across the board, aren't they? And I also don't want to leave the story of veterans without saying what a gift that they're giving us, the ones with the PTSD, because they're teaching, like I say, their PTSD, a lot of these veterans, their PTSD started before the war. Do we not know rape victims? Do we not know domestic violence victims? Do we not think that the people who aren't sure that they're safe walking to and from school every day aren't growing up with some PTSD? And are the veterans leading the way on teaching us how to listen and how to heal people in these desperate situations? So, yeah. Anyway, I have taken my time at 725. And is the sideways snow done? <laughs> uh, anyway, well, thank you. You can get a refill of coffee. Um, and uh, I'm assuming that people are going to want to get home instead of sit around and talk. So I'm not even going to offer that option. But <laughs> I will be around. Thanks.